Okay, so heard a lot of people saying that Apple or Microsoft or even Google basically invented the computer, and to be honest, this is just flat out wrong. However, there was a company that could kind of be invented, credited for inventing modern computing, and that is IBM. Today we're going to be talking about IBM, how they began to develop computing to the extent it is today, and ultimately how they ended up getting kicked out of the computer market. So IBM was founded as a merger of three companies in 1911. However, these companies that merged to form IBM had histories going back, some of them all the way into 1880. However, we're going to be starting in 1911. One of the things it immediately became known for was its Think slogan. This originated when Thomas J. Watson, the CEO of the newly founded IBM, interrupted a meeting and said, The trouble with every one of us is that we don't think enough. We don't get paid for working with our feet. We get paid for working with our heads. Watson, after, after he said that, wrote, Think on an easel. IBM produced many devices. One of the more notable of them being the first printing tabulator. <clears throat> the IBM tabulators actually became the origin of the term supercomputer. IBM was also the first company to sell a tabulator to Japan. And at this point, they ended up making a rally song that I think kind of describes their position at this point. Here it is. Books and turn to page five. Page five in the songbook, we'll do one verse and two choruses of Ever Onward on page five of the songbook. <laughs> There's a thrilling score for all who hear about the coast, the corporation that will ever land. We're here to cheer and fly and hear an awful family boat. All that man of men are friend and guiding hand. The name of T.J. Watson means the courage that can So, yeah, this was something that IBM would continue to do for a long time. IBM continued to make tabulators, and one of them was the first one to be capable of subtracting, and they also patented in rectangular holes in the punch cards that the tabulators used, which ended cross-vendor compatibility. Next, the Great Depression came in the 1930s. However, IBM was able to actually do better at the end of the Great Depression. And Watson ended up kind of betting the company on his strategy, which was to continue to innovate and produce machines that would be better and better, even though no one would buy them. This initially looked like it would be very bad, and they continued to produce tabulators with no customers on full-scale production for six years. And it would have surely been a disaster if IBM ran out of cash, as there was no one to sell the company to, of course, since this was the Great Depression. However, in 1935, the Social Security Act was introduced. It was considered the greatest accounting operation of all time. And IBM ended up winning the bid for this because they were the only company that could supply necessary equipment. Watson's decisions during the 1930s, of course, involved investing in technology and research. By the end of the 1930s, IBM was at the front of the industry. 
he was, though, a bit concerned that World War II, if it broke out, would not be very good for his business based on what happened to businesses during World War I. However, this didn't exactly prove to be true, as IBM did fairly good in World War II. It was fairly controversial, though, as they not only supplied the Allies with machines, but they also supplied machines to the Nazis. One of them was used to catalog Jews during the Holocaust, and... Yeah, that obviously was not very good. However, they continued to send computers to Germany even after World War II broke out. Of course, though, there were companies in the U.S. that were even worse with this. For example, Ford, who literally sued the U.S. government and won over the fact that the U.S. military had bombed Ford tank-making factories in Germany during the Second World War. So, yeah, that's kind of what I think of that. However, I'm not saying that what IBM did was right or anything. However, after World War II was when IBM began to seriously innovate in the computer market. However, they didn't initially get off to start with really computers. They first made a typewriter that was the first one to have Chinese characters in 1946, as well as hiring their first black salesman in 1946. Then came one of the first digital computers ever made in 1948, called the IBM SSEC. And it wasn't entirely digital, but it was mainly, and it also didn't have all these cables hanging around that most computers at the time did. This was a big improvement. It did, however, despite being very good and successful, become obsolete quite quickly in just four years next main computer that IBM made was the IBM 701, built in 1952. It was also released alongside the IBM 702 and 650. And these continued IBM's computers. In 1956, IBM produced the world's first ever magnetic hard disk. And this was a big deal, since information was a lot harder to store on a computer until this was produced. Its storage was worth approximately $10,000 per megabyte. But then a consent decree was made that forced IBM to sell their hard disks for use with other computers, which stopped IBM from basically monopolizing the computer industry. So they've already invented the hard disk, basically. And then they made the first self-learning AI, which could play checkers. This was basically the first self-learning AI ever made. And yes, it was made by IBM. So yeah, Google's still saying that they've come up with the concept and it's brand new to this day. It's not brand new. It was made in 1956, but it was brand new really then. IBM then made Fortran, which quickly became the world's most commonly used programming language. And then they made the IBM 1403 printer in 1959. This printer's quality would not be matched until laser printing came around in the 1970s. That's like 20 years. Then IBM introduced computers pretty much as we know them with their System 360. They now made it with peripherals that were interchangeable between the computers. For example, your keyboard wouldn't be exclusive to one computer. And system software that ran on them, especially with CPM, would now run on multiple computers. Instead of your OS just really only running on one computer. So that'd be like if for every computer you had, you need a specific program for it. Was kind of the way it was. This made it so that programs could actually run on more than just one computer. This was a big deal. This kind of changed everything, and this really made computers the way we know them now, and pretty much invented the computer. The next thing they invented was the floppy disk in 1971, which finally made storage portable, and it was much smaller than other devices. Here, if you look at this picture, you can see how big hard drives used to be, and that used to be the only real way you could store like a megabyte or much less even. Floppy disks did that and were much better. The IBM also contributed a lot to the moon landings and they may not have been possible without IBM. 
Now, it looked like IBM had basically taken over the computer industry. However, this started to change with the advent of microcomputers. And by 1970, they'd had 60% market share, but they had gone down to 30% in 1980. And since IBM had missed this market with DEC mainly gaining this market share, stuff wasn't looking that great. However, now that the personal computers appeared to become a thing, IBM started making a major effort to produce personal computers. And they got off to a pretty good start. They made the IBM PC. It made all the features that you would find desirable in a computer all into one machine, and they made it affordable, even though it was quite expensive, it was kind of affordable. And, yeah. They also now made its first killer app, as they called them, Lotus123, which was much better than Apple's VisiCalc. And by 1985, everyone thought that IBM would probably monopolize the PC industry. However, things weren't all as they seemed, but that's a subject for part two. Here is one of their ads for the IBM PC 5150 before I end this video. In these modern times, the person who goes to work may not have far to go. But at the head of the month club, the boss better keep moving. To keep the books, organize the files, write the letters, check out the inventory, find time to create, and still keep on top of things. Yet even a thriving business can reach a point of diminishing returns. A good time to learn about the IBM personal computer. With this tool for modern times, a person can quickly master such jobs as accounting or word processing. Even use the IBM personal computer to forecast growth. All helping the business person at home to wear many hats. While selling even more. And that can be a feather in anyone's cap. The IBM personal computer. Try one on at a store near you. If you're thinking of buying a personal computer, and all the signs say it's time to take the first step, a few questions may still be holding you back. Will your PC have the power you want to run the software you want? What about expandability? Adoption of equipment? And how much money is it going to take? If these questions set your mind, now is a good time to look at IBM. The complete answer. An IBM PC can run the latest, most powerful programs and give you almost unlimited expandability with options like the new IBM printers and the IBM PC network. And today, prices are better than ever. So, don't wait. Once you take the first step, the rest come easy. IBM personal computers. See them at a store near you or call your IBM representative. Thanks for watching. Please like and subscribe. Bye.